Chiron is retrograde in the 14th degree of Aries, and it's going to be doing that until first week in November. Now, Chiron is a rather unusual energy, unusual in the sense that it's, it's not the inner planets, very personal, and it's not the outer planets either, very objective and societal, historical. Chiron bridges between the inner and the outer, so between self-centered consciousness and universal consciousness. And it is interesting that when planets are discovered, the wisdom that they hold, the secret, the mystery, the magic that they hold is uncovered at that time. And um, we had an interesting thing, a quirky thing, very often with Chiron is quirkiness, that it was actually discovered in the 40s, and then they lost it. <laughs> and then it was discovered properly, shall we say, in 76, I think. And around that time, a lot was happening. There, it, there, there was an unfolding of consciousness that was unusually accelerated that had to do with the 60s revolution, but didn't really become mature in, in terms of like making a real difference to the lives of a significant number of people until the 70s. And later, the 80s was when the movement really began and, and workshops and activities of that kind mushroomed in popularity. And this was at the same time that Chiron was discovered. And there's no coincidence there. Chiron shifts our perception. It changes us, basically, I would think, from being pessimists to being optimists. I would say that's his fundamental job, introducing a way of interpreting our issues, our neuroses, our problems, so that they're actually gifts rather than penalties. And that shift is, is a a dance within the, the mind, within within the brain even. We're changing the operation of the synapses in the in the brain to make us think differently. And to learn how to use Chiron properly, really we have to train ourselves in every moment to turn a negative thought around. I've introduced for myself a personal discipline. If I catch myself thinking a ne negative thought, I'll say a little prayer. So I'm kind of conditioning myself to turn any negativity around by affirming positivity when I experience myself as negative. So I'm training myself towards greater and greater positivity of thinking. So that's what Chiron is doing wherever it is. And we have the very delicate job today to discuss Aries 14. Now, the serpent coiling near a man and a woman, making relationships sacred. We get drawn into relationship by sexual desire and emotional need to learn how to internalize polarity. Rebellious immaturity is only to be dealt with when we master polarity inwardly, rather than by seeking another person to make up for our lack of wisdom and emotional poise. Facing relationship in sacredness is the key. A man and a woman with a serpent coiling nearby. What does that remind you of? It's the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. And... Very few people, if any, are approaching one-to-one -one relationship in sacredness. And that's what's advised here. We have come a long way down, down, down from the time when sexuality was celebrated in a prayerful way, in a sacred way as is taught in Tantra. And there may well be practitioners of Tantra, there certainly are in certain places, who can understand that the energy of sex is the highest, the 
the raising of the Kundalini is, is at, at play here. And the Kundalini is basically the energy that links Shiva and Shakti, or cosmic consciousness, and earthly spirituality. So it's the physicality of form and the nebulousness of energy doing their dance and creating this buzz of electricity up the, the spine, um, which goes through all of the chakras. Um, now, the word Kundalini has become a bit of a, a byword for all manner of other things in by way of relationship. And it's, it, it, we're not really only talking about creating a wholesome engagement with your partner. That's absolutely part of it. But it goes beyond that. We're talking about the serpent. And the serpent is reminiscent of the Kundalini. It's a metaphor for the Kundalini. Now, the Kundalini energy is vertical. Um, and the serpent is is typically lying on its belly nowadays. And this is the fall. The, the, the serpent has fallen from the vertical position to the the horizontal. In other words, the kundalini energy is no longer operating. That's what that metaphor means on the esoteric plane. So to, ra to raise your uh, awareness of the sacredness of sex is to take the energy up from the base elements of your being, the base chakra, the second and third chakras, these lower chakras, which are potentially sacred. It's just that they have degenerated and, and, and uh, we have a distortion of energy in them. So it's not only lust that replaces tantric sex, it is also aggression and greed and, and fear and those kind of energies, the lower energies of our body have been distorted because they're not sanctified, they're desecrated. And um, that's the fundament of change that must occur for humanity as a species to rescue itself. We've de degenerated and degraded so much since the golden times before history that now we are in this terrible state that we're in where greed and blame and guilt and these heavier, dark energies have replaced the, the lightness that, that should be there. So, Aries 14 is, is, a, is, is a very big message, really. It, it is to at least begin to honour your relationships, um, especially sexual ones. It, it, it's wider than this. It's even wider than the concept of relationship. It's to do with honouring the relationship within you of the male and the female energies. So, a part of you is soft and caring and responsive and accepting and a part of you is assertive and thrusting and, and, and decisive and, and so on. Um, each of these parts of you have to be a, unified in, in a sacred way so that you're not habituated to one or the other style of being. And especially if you've got a certain body, like a male's body, tends to attract the male energy. So men are more often aggressive than women. It's by no means universal, of course. And we have in Aries 4, for example, the two lovers strolling, an example of the need to balance polarities, a teaching of that kind. And here we come to 14, we're saying, look, this is still the case. You still need to balance your energies, um, only all the more so, because now there's this third element, the serpent. And a serpent is a very emotive energy. It has a lot to do with sexuality. And yet our sense of snakes and dragons and serpent-like things is mainly to do with disgust and fear. And we, in the West at least, we kill all of our snake images. All of the saints and other images in Christianity, they go around killing snakes and dragons and all the heroes. You know, we've got this psyche in the West that, that, that you kill snakes. That's what you do with them. And um, you don't honour them, which is much more frequently done in other cultures, where they they learn to 
handle snakes, uh, snake handlers, you know, snake charmers. That's much more an Eastern thing than a Western thing. And indeed, there is a lot less neurotic attitude towards sex in places like India, where they celebrate it and, and make it into a, a spiritual teaching in some cases. So Chiron is revisiting this energy, retrograde, for a period of weeks. This time may well be a time for us to consider how we're doing in this question of relating, perhaps firstly to our sexual partner, then towards anyone who is intimately connected, where their involvement with us is, is meaningful, and then perhaps finally with ourselves. And we understand that whatever need we feel for another person is a projection. We don't really need that other person, actually. What we need to do is to change something within ourselves, to balance something eternally, internally as well, <laughs> um, so that um, we don't come to the world, we don't come to a sexual partner from a position of need. Because that's the beginning of all of the problems that you'll ever find in life, that you project your, le your needs out into the world instead of dealing with them. Much more easily said than done. It, it is not an easy thing to do. But it is impossible to do that unless you recognize it to be the case. Um, and that's a rare event. How many relationships are fundamentally based on finger pointing? It's your fault. You did that to me. One way or the other, it may be that one blames and the other puts up with being blamed. Don't know who's the worst offender there, to be honest. They're equally complicit in that blame game. And it's not okay. At all. If you hold anyone else responsible for your feelings, you, you, you've missed the point entirely. Everything you feel is yours. And if you feel neediness for another person and you require them to be a certain way, you're robbing them of their freedom, of their sovereignty, of their essence self by doing that. And they're allowing you by allowing the projection to be put onto them. That doesn't work. It's, it's not only wrong and silly and counterproductive. It just doesn't serve you. It, it doesn't work. It creates a falseness that can't survive. So Chiron is saying, look, think differently about this. Change your mind about what relationship is, what you want out of relationship, balance with what you have to give. And if you think about a typical relationship where each is actually blaming the other to some extent, that necessarily sucks energy out of a relationship. If you blame someone else, you're not feeding good energy into a situation, you're withdrawing it, you're sucking it out to deal with some hole you have within yourself. And that means that the, the two parents, shall we say, of children are sucking more out of the relationship than they're giving into it. And the shortfall of energy in that family situation is made up by the baby and the baby then is trying to give love to both parents to deal with their absence of it and the baby grows up to be in shortfall too and and, and then they become a parent whose inclination is to blame and it goes on and on and on and the sins of the fathers are meted on the sons and throughout all of the generations. The only way to stop this is to stop blaming your partner and to take responsibility for all of your own feelings. And if you feel neediness, then just speak of it. I feel neediness. If you speak of anger in the same way, I feel anger. Not I'm angry with you or you did that, but I'm experiencing anger at the moment. That must have come from my personal history. And, and, and your partner can then help you talk about that. And as you talk about it, bit by bit, over time, that heals it. And that's Chiron's job, 
is to change our approach to pain and hurt and suffering and to turn what we perceived before as the wound into a gift. So when you've learned how to do this, you can help other people who've got the same issue that you had. That's Chiron's workable way of going forward. But mainly it's to do with perception, perceptual shift. So if we just take this opportunity when Chiron is going through Aries 14 to look carefully at how we relate to people, especially the, the special other in sex, and just see whether or not when you're in, involved in intimate contact, your energetic exchange is loving and giving and energizing, or whether or not it's actually claiming and taking and, and demanding which of those two is more likely a description of what you're doing? Either way, you know, one of you is maybe taking more than the other, but either way, if one of you is taking, it's not okay. That's For it, this to be what you want it to be and, and what humanity wants it to be, both of you have to give a little bit more than you take. And then there's this development of love and superabundance of, of caring energy and, and that's what the children pick up on later and they, they get to live in an atmosphere of love because each partner is giving more than they're taking to each other.